the fire. Whenever we have men that are actually masculine men that do the three things that you just said, David, about having a, a man who has the will to obey, who obey what? Obey God, right? And the work to live, to provide, you know, sustenance, to provide for his family and to have purpose. And then a woman to love. You know, when you talk about those kinds of things, having a man like that allows a woman to do the woman's role that God gave her to be and to follow God and obey God and to serve her purpose. Welcome to Through the Fire. Cutting through the passions, clearing the smoke of the cultural confusions of the world today. Talking God's love and God's solutions from a biblical Christian worldview. And now, here's your host, Marie and Gregory Seltz. The doctors are in. Hello, hello, everybody. I'm Marie. And I'm Greg. And welcome to Through the Fire, where we are on the case talking about the tough issues in the culture today facing them with some psychological and theological wisdom and applications that we hope will bless you. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. All right. And today we're talking about healthy masculinity and why it's so important to talk about it now. And I want to tell you a little bit about our guest, David Savage, David L. Savage, because there's a number of David Savages out there, and I don't want to get you confused by the one that we are having um a great conversation with today. David is a podcaster and radio host of Wrestling with the Inner Man. He is the author of The Savage Path, a memoir of modern masculinity. David grew up as an Air Force brat in West Texas, and I love that, may I say. He was deeply involved in scouting, achieving the rank of Eagle Scout and earning bronze, silver, and gold palms. He is a graduate of Texas A&M, Gigum Aggies, yes, where he studied engineering. That's right. And he's an avid backpacker with a passion for history and geopolitics. Could you could you love this guy more? Uh, I know. Got to be careful. I know. (laughs) (laughs) Romance. He He and his wife Kimberly have been married for eighteen years, and as a blend family, have raised four children, three sons and one daughter. David has been involved with men's ministries throughout his life, which I think is also wonderful. David has been a lifelong backpacker and outdoorsman and has been blessed to have a group of five older advisors who, along with David, call themselves the six pack. Is that not the coolest thing? Okay, they, these guys have backpacked for 25 years together to provide some of the rich and humorous stories that David uses to illustrate his points in the book. Wow, can't wait to talk about all this. And, and his book is so, I have to say, I really enjoy it on so many different levels. There, He has personal pictures in there and just anecdotes, all kinds of things. So, yeah. Yeah, welcome, David, to the program. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. Good All right. Here. Well, let's get into it. Just jump in. Baby. So, David, what prompted you to write this book, and why is it so important? Well, I will say that the genesis of the idea was the destruction, the teardown of the Boy Scouts of America. Wow. Oh, yeah. Really? That, that was, uh, I, it was just a bridge too far. I couldn't take it. Uh, I, I was supporting the Boy Scouts, you know, financially and any, any way that I could. And I said, look, you know, keep keep fighting. And they, they had been taken to the Supreme court multiple times. And then, you know, they've just, uh, succumbed. And right. so I also, you know, am, I'm not living in a, you know, a cave and, and I'm looking at the political environment and I'm kind of feeling like Christians now are, I don't know if we have enough of us to win elections anymore. I, I, I would like to believe that we do, mm-hmm. but I wanted to, uh, be like the, the Jews of the diaspora and actually document the way things used to be. So, you know, once things get all messed up and then there's some uh, genealogist in the future trying to figure out how families were put together, that that he'll go, man, how did we used to do this? And they'll go back and they'll say, oh, we found this book, The Savage Path. That's how it used to be done. That's what masculinity (laughs) used to look like. And and so a a lot of it is a tip of the hat to uh, the Boy Scouts and my debt to scouting uh, and so that, that was really the, the primary genesis of the idea. Well, you know, it's funny. Yesterday, uh, I was traveling yesterday, and I got it. I had an Uber ride on steroids, and we were talking about that. He was talking about family. He was talking about masculinity. He was talking about the way it was where he comes from. He comes from East Africa, and we were talking about that. And I said to him, we used to be like that too. 
And he, he thought about it, and he said, you know, I, I talked to many people who talk that way about our grandparents who had nine and ten kids or five or six kids, and, and men were men. They protected, and they cared for their family, and they worked hard because they wanted their family to have what they wanted. And, and they raised boys, and they raised their daughters, you know, for certain ways. And he was like, yeah, I heard you guys used to actually think this was really important. Mm-hmm. And so, again, I guess the question is not only how did we get here, but what does healthy masculinity look like? Yeah. What does it look like? Well, I think it it's three things. You got to have a will to obey, a work to do, and a woman to love. That's kind of the thread through the book that I uh, I have adopted. Some of that's from uh, John Eldridge, Wild at Heart. Some of it's from yeah, remember that. Robert Lewis, Raising a Modern Day Night. Some of it's from my scouting background. But, you know, the, the wilderness is the metaphor for my book yeah. on Savage Path because I'm a backpacker and a lot of it's backpacking stories. And when you're backpacking, there's a trail usually, you know, and you want to stay on the trail, <laughs> but sometimes you get off the trail and man, you can only be off the trail 15 feet, but if you're downhill from it, you can't see it. And then you're in the woods and you're stepping over down timber and rattlesnakes and, you know, you're lost essentially. And, you know, when you're in your own will, that's where you are. You're off the trail. God's got a plan and a provision for us and we need to be under his will and you have to seek to discern that will. And you also have to uh, pray that you can be uh, obedient to it if you can discern it. Yeah. I mean, in order to lead, you have to learn how also to obey in the sense, in the healthiest sense of the word. And I remember even in my young ministry life, I was an associate a lot. I was this kind of guy like a wildcatter. I wanted to get out there and start things and do things. How do how come the Lord put me in this situation where I had to learn to work with people above me? Mm-hmm. And it was the greatest learning experience because then when I did finally lead, I would I really knew how to actually lift up the people who were, you know, underneath me now in leadership. And you're you're right. If you get off the path, if you you might think you're a wildcatter, you're just leading people over the edge. Right. Yeah, it's it's dangerous. And, you know, you get nicked up out there. It's just more comfortable to be on the path. You know, (laughs) you can take in the scenery. It'll take you to the lakes and the water, the things that you need Uh shelter. So uh, that's but we are all human. We are all sinners. You know, we're all creatures of the flesh. Uh, You know, that's how I uh, came up with the name for the podcast, Wrestling with the Inner Man, because, you know, my little tagline on that is because. Every day, you know, we wake up with the same fight, you know, listen to our selfish, sinful nature, or are we going to try to respond to the Holy Spirit inspired divine nature that's in all of us if if we've accepted Christ? Mm -hmm. And so that's a big wrestling match. And it's every day on many, many issues and uh, as unlimited content. Yeah, (laughs) that's right. Absolutely. I think Greg has more of a struggle with that, David, than I do in the morning. No. That's yeah, what I'm saying. Little angel on this shoulder, little devil <laughs> on this shoulder, and uh, yeah, I, yeah. I mean, I have this etherealness about me. You know, it's just very angelic, and I well, I like Jacob, intuitive. baby. I just, I, I, you know, when we wrestle, I just say, I will not let you go until you bless me. Uh-huh. That's right. <laughs> hey, that's actually the uh, that my image. You know, on the on the podcast is the, is Jacob wrestling with the angel, this uh-huh. dark uh, silhouette that wrestling with the white angel. So. I like that. Yeah. Well, you know, there are so many things that I, I I really like about your book. Like right now, when you were talking about using the the hiking on a path in the wilderness and being led right to water when you need it the safety and security of it and and just the direction there's just so many things that you talk about in the book and you use a lot of anecdotes and you're so honest in it yeah a lot of people were surprised how could you how could you put that down in a book put that out there and honestly my wife wasn't real thrilled about it you know because it's our life when you're talking about your (laughs) memoir and so we had a little bit of a wrestling match of our own (laughs) about that and 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 i have to be careful also with the the podcast because right. you know what honesty does is it builds trust yeah because when you're vulnerable then people realize hey you know I'm, I'm not the only one struggling with this or you know doubting myself or get angry easily over certain issues or maybe even just struggling with a temper mm-hmm. which is something i had tremendous uh, difficulty with early in my life and i'm still you know i still have to kind of keep that in check because there's certain things like you know driving behavior in houston that can just uh, immediately flashed me right back <laughs> the worst the worst place even almost as bad as la yes 
Well, let me ask you this, you know, again about then dealing with oneself. There is a point, too, where men have to have other men uh, in their life to, to become the men that God wants them to be. And you have your guys, the six-pack guys, right. and maybe there are some conversations that are between you and each other so that you can be a person for your wife, for for the women in your life. And, and sometimes we have to learn even how to discern those conversations, I think, right? Mm-hmm. Right. And, you know, you have to turn off. We, we had a lot of these conversations, you know, over the... Uh, over the tenure of our backpacking because I went through a divorce in 1999 and I, I actually, you know, men, we want to just kind of retreat to the cave and hide out. You don't want to see anybody. And, you know, they're like, no, we go on this trip every year, David, you gotta, you gotta go. And we went, we went to Alaska and, you know, I try to paint like a word picture for people because this is a, this is an audio show. And, you know, so you have to imagine, you know, the day you're hiking, guys are cutting up, giving each other a hard time. And, uh, you know, crop dusting one another on the trail <laughs> from dehydrated food and things like that. Well, then you get to camp, you get all set up and you cook your meal and then you're sitting there and maybe some of them have some cigars and, and you see this blazing fire and you kind of can see everybody's face mm-hmm. and you're kind of talking about, you know, Hey, when we saw that moose or something. And then as that fire kind of begins to burn down and just to coals, you don't see the flames. Well, then you kind of just see a silhouette and pretty soon all you're looking at is just the ember of, the cigar and it's like it's becoming more and more sacred it's just like now we're we're revealing ourselves in deeper and deeper layers and saying okay look this is what i came here to talk about i'm 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 really having a tough time with this issue and and lots of times we would actually have an issue for each night that we would try to uh-huh. you know solve the world's problem we talk about you know racism we talk about Christianity, atheism, all kinds of things that we really would get into serious conversations about. But when you have to get away from phones and distractions and devices to have those kind of conversations, then you got to have people that you trust. Mm -hmm. And many nights we would just stay up very late, just no fire left, looking up the stars and just Mm. really contemplating, you know, the expanse of creation and kind of feeling in a big, big world, you know, that's a big God. And uh, we tend to we kind of try to put him in a box. So uh, outdoors, in his creation, best place in the world to feed your soul and to build those kind of trusting relationships. Right. And in your book, you talk about political correctness and toxic masculinity. So were these some of the topics that you all talked about around the campfire? Yeah, because one of the guys is an HR guy, and we oh, he no. always got picked on, you know, because he was like the tattler, you know, whatever. <laughs> it's, like, it's like, oh, you know, you got to follow this. This is the protocol. But we, you know, we you can't say anything, you know, it seems anymore. You know, you're you're judged and you're criticized. And so we had one one guy who was an HR guy. We had one guy who was kind of a, a, an environmental person. He was also kind of a tattler. You know, those two guys mm-hmm. tended to be just more pessimistic in nature, worried about things. And then then we had, you know, the the top executive guy who was just kind of like the command and control person. Right. I, I was a sales guy. <laughs> then we had a marketing kind of computer guy. And we're like, well, this little six pack of guys could really run a, run a company. <laughs> you no. Know, yeah. And, and we talked about that. You know, uh, we actually talked about buying the Exxon Billings refinery, you know, because it was where we wanted to go backpacking and it was for sale at the right price. And this guy was a former Exxon employee and I just think it's yeah. funny, though, but, you know, you talk about the ability to have these conversations and then to actually become the men that, mm-hmm. that God wants you to be. And I think that's what the culture is doing to us. It's not letting us have these conversations with other men mm-hmm. so that we can become the men that our women need. We can become the men that our sons and daughters need. You know, they're saying, no, this egalitarian kind of libertinism where we're all going to be kind of meshed into the same equity outcome masculinity right. fights against right that. and when they're, th- they're controlling the language and yeah. and like you said the conversation and what you said to me just now greg was uh very important at yeah. least to me as a woman whenever we have men that are actually masculine men that do the three things that you just said david about having a, a man who has the will to obey who obey what obey god right, right and right, and god's right. call and, right. and direction and and the f- definition of what he is his role is to be right and um, the 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 work to live to provide you know sustenance and provide for his family and to have purpose and to to be uh, productive and, and giving back and and creating th- something and then a woman to love you know when you talk about those kinds of things 
having a man like that allows a woman to do the woman's role that God gave her to be and, and to follow God and obey God and to, to, to serve her purpose. What's happening today, I mean, with this gender confusion and the people now saying they're going to raise their children without any gender role definitions and without any kind of direction, there's so much confusion out there right now with... And I don't know how this can be good. I don't see anything as a therapist. I don't see anything psychologically that can be good uh, of it. I just see complete confusion, greediness. Uh, we're going back to kind of a, uh, you know, dog eats dog kind of world. I don't see any kind of why would anybody try to live to serve another human being? Well, why would you know, you? I think using your metaphor, too, and, and you can jump on both of these. Uh, most men will retreat into their cave mm-hmm. because right. they're being browbeaten by society, and a few machismos will come out and say it's our it's our turf, get out of here. And women will be vulnerable again in ways that yeah, they're it doesn't not today. serve women at all. And you, you I can, don't see any way. You can see in this it. in the city. I mean, we've done city ministry for what twenty five years, mm-hmm. you know, before this, and it was the girls and the women that were always vulnerable, and the men were in the the, the guys that were afraid were in their caves, and the machismos were taken over the streets. Mm-hmm. And that's what we see all over the country but today. But they just, it, the definition of masculinity today, at least the one they want us to embrace, is that, you know, machismo kind of It's either a machismo or you're, you're, you're kowtowed. And what we want is strong men who serve. Who have a strong backbone and have conviction. And, and yeah. yeah. Well, it's, I mean, yeah. Servant, so jump servant leadership. Yeah, that, that's really, you know, the way Christ loves the church, you know, and that's right. because women really struggle. You know, the I think feminism was was good and they they achieved some things but it, it became militant and it went just yeah, too far absolutely and this look at the uh the entertainment industry now you know captain america is a woman all the guys are just doofuses and beer commercials and how <laughs> men have been portrayed and and women are you know punching men out and all that and yeah, that, that's just that not true it's just, it, these are lies mm-hmm. these are lies i don't know what the hope is to what, what would that world look like mm-hmm. if you don't even have a gender on your birth certificate and you grow up in a confused world? I, you know, I, we did a podcast yesterday and I was talking with my guests about uh, a divorcing parents seminar in Texas. You have to take this class if you uh, if you're getting a divorce and you have children. Mm-hmm. And so this guy, I was living in Beaumont, Texas mm-hmm. at the time. And there's this real high bridge uh, that goes over the ship channel. So the big oil tankers and other ships can go under that bridge. And a lot of people are uncomfortable driving over that bridge mm-hmm. and just because it's high and they look off and it's a long way down. And so he said, look, imagine uh, how many people would just don't drive over that bridge now. And, and about half the room raised their hand. Wow. And he said, well, what if you took the, uh, the boundaries, the concrete barricades, everything off the side, it's exactly the same roadway and it's the same asphalt and everything else. And it's striped, but there's no barricades on the side. Now, how many people would be uncomfortable driving over that bridge. Mm -hmm. And then it was about 75% of the class. Then he goes, okay, now take the stripes off. Even there's nothing. Mm, It's exactly the same roadway, but it's no stripes, nothing, you know, decide which side you're supposed to be on now, how many, and and no one would want to drive over that bridge. It's the same road, but everybody wants boundaries because Mm -hmm. boundaries make you feel secure. Mm -hmm. And that means I know what my role is in the family. I know what I'm supposed to do. And these, these two individuals were, uh, retired army uh one was an officer and one was an nco and they they created and ran a rotc program uh, at a new high school nice. and we were talking about how this is manifesting itself in the military you know mm-hmm. and i asked them about these three generals you know that had written a letter to west point saying this whole woke thing is uh, co-opting the whole you know the whole military mm-hmm. and this is a this is a big problem and there there's nothing good behind it right it's right. evil it's just evil it is right. Well, okay, now I got to get you in trouble because, you know, usually when I have a kind of a man to woman talk with my wife, I get in trouble. And you have all these anecdotes and you have all kinds of stories in the book. And so I'd like you to tell a story or tell something that might come to mind that can illustrate some of the what we're talking about here that might get you in trouble with my wife. <gasps> <laughs> no. Okay. I'm, well, just te- I'm just teasing. I'm just teasing. I'm just saying every time I'm too honest, I get in some kind of trouble. <laughs> well, I have one just about every chapter because look, when I was right when I decided I wanted to write the book, uh, Gary Thomas, who wrote Sacred Marriage, you know, was the writer in residence at Second Baptist. And I went and I talked to him. And I said, Hey, I'm thinking about writing this book. It's kind of a men's ministry book, but I, it's not too too churchy. And I want it to be, I want it to have a broader appeal. I'm not a pastor. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, but I want it to be funny. And he goes, man, if you can if you can write something that's got some humor in it, that's really distinctive. Yeah. That would really differentiate you, and it would be really good. And so, and you know, I I, I, lo- I love to laugh, and I know <laughs> many jokes. And my wife has been trying to tease this out of me for a long time, and I you know I I revert. <laughs> but, <laughs> Uh, Revert to the mean, my friend. (laughs) Yeah. Now you just can't laugh at anything, you know, any kind of a joke. Uh, And look, I'm an Aggie, you know, all the all the Aggie jokes I've had to (laughs) suffer and and endure. And and you're a bit of a showman because you were a drum major. So you you like being out in the front like that. Yes, he was. He was in the band. Uh, Yes. I was really a show off diving. (laughs) That was really my thing. I was a, a, you know. I dove on the springboard oh, platform diving and things. Yeah. And, and that would, you know, at a and I'd even go do a handstand and I'd just wait until I could hear all the girls down there. You know, <laughs> <laughs> before you, I'd even do my dive. Man, the 10 meter platform, man, you're a man's man. Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, <laughs> until I jumped off some cliffs after a few beers and had some bad. <laughs> Is that in the book? <laughs> uh, no, I didn't know that story in the book. No. But, there's a lot of the funny scout ones and stuff. There was, there's one, one chapter in there is uh, ladies versus loyalty, which mm-hmm. is, yes. I, I don't know. Have you, have you read that one? Yet? I did. Uh, mm-hmm. Okay. So, you know, I'm a lifeguard at this air force base and uh, you know, a lot of the guys that were coming to the school to be trained there are in this, uh, it's cryptology and linguistic school. It's very difficult and sometimes they wash out and then they are kind of stuck waiting to see whatever their next orders are but they were just uh, within a year or two of my age you know i was 18 and there was one extremely attractive woman and her name was joanne and i, I remember the miss clairol commercials in the box that she wore this bathing suit that had pink or poke or it had green polka dots look on him. it look at him Cheryl now Teets. talking about it look at him <laughs> yeah yeah i'm like oh man, i remember <laughs> And, and all of these guys would just summarily one by one, go up, try to ask her out. She would just shoot them down, shoot them down. Shoot them. We called her the snuff queen. And I felt so bad for, uh, right. for all these guys, you know, and they were like, man, you know, we don't know how to get to her. I don't really know what her issue was, but she would come in sun every day and read books. And, and I was a lifeguard. And then, I, so I would go on my break and I would dive and, and, you know, I would try to show off and then. One day I, I, I finished, you know, diving and then I got up in the stand and I had my mirrored sunglasses on and uh, she came up and, you know, she looked at me and she goes, David, you know, where did you learn to dive like that? And, and I just looked at her and I didn't even say anything. I just pointed to the sign and it says, you know, please do not talk to the lifeguard while on duty. Are you and kidding? No, no. It was so awesome because I was literally like carried around the pool on the shoulders of all the other guys. And uh which made her try harder. And no, it's always yeah. thing going on for the whole summer. And I, I knew as soon as I revealed any weakness or interest, then she would just completely crush me. So <laughs> I never knew if there was any real legitimate interest. There. Okay, honey, do, do you understand oh, what we just see? This is the a man has to. Uh, <laughs> when I when I dated this woman, I'm going to tell you, there were so many guys I had to fight. And I had to finally, I, I couldn't do the do not talk to the lifeguard because she would have just said, okay, I won't and I'm, I'm gone. But I had to do a little of it. I had to do a little of it somehow to, to rise to the top of her. Of I the wasn't heap. worried. <laughs> but she, oh my gosh, that's not pre- even that a is little a funny bit. St- See, now that would be a man's man story around the, fu- the, the, the yes. bonfire. We yes. could not tell that to our wives. They'd be like, ah, oh, no, yeah, you think no, you're that probably, way. Yeah. <laughs> but, I wasn't worried. <laughs> coquetry you know where they're going to try to you know get you interested in it's it's just all part of that uh that courtship dance sure you know? it is it yeah. is and and you you actually you have a program coming up where you're going to be talking about courtship and how to you want to talk a little bit about that right now for our listeners sure. uh, okay. so you know after i went through my divorce i i was uh you know chief of the he-man woman haters club you know to take the line yeah. from uh, little rascals and uh you know, I just wasn't ever, I wasn't going to get married. You know, I was really pretty uh, hard hearted, but then I, you know, I was flying around the country. I took a promotion. I was uh, just worn out uh, really from uh, working to try to escape my pain. And then, and I encountered a, a USA Today review of a book by two professors at the University of Michigan, mm-hmm. husband and wife sociologist uh, named Cass, K-A-S-S. And it was called Wing to Wing, Or to Or, Readings on Courtship and Marrying. And and I was really fascinated by the review. And then I bought this big, thick book. And it, it's basically 
kind of a compilation of the best writing on the subject of marriage and courtship over all history, really, you know, from the Bible, Kierkegaard, uh, Rousseau, all, all these great authors, and then they would kind of dissect it. And so after I read that whole thing, I realized that my dad really hadn't given me much marital advice the first time. And I was like, you know, I think I was made to be married, but I was trying to avoid becoming married. But if I really was intentional and I was looking for the right woman and was really pursuing her diligently, courting her, winning her, then, you know, that's the way it should be done. And so I kind of went through this whole winning her and keeping her right and keeping her. Yes, that's right. In fact, we're taking Fred Astaire dance lessons now. That's you know? right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, uh, Anyway, that, that was a real interesting process for me. And then that's how I met Kim, my lovely wife of 20 years now. We just had our 20th anniversary. And uh, and it's just because God was, you know, that that cord of three strands. And right. so I've, I've, I think that a lot of young men out there aren't getting any of that coaching. There's, you know, the, the reason why these two sociologists uh, wrote the book is that they, you know, they're at a major university like the University of Michigan. And they're seeing all these 18 year old students come in. There's no dating. They they just go out like to bars, hook up, you know, have relations and then disperse. And it's just so there's no intimacy whatsoever. And it was really appalling to them. They wanted to do something about it. Yeah. So uh, I did a, a series in the fall on the, the podcast called uh, Charm School mm -hmm. 101. Mm -hmm. And it's like, when was the last time you felt like some you, you met a true charming person where they really charmed you? And uh, and so uh, that was probably my top podcast that's been downloaded mm -hmm. and by men and women. And so now my next project, and I'm going to have your lovely wife, you know, as one of my guests that's on there. Right. Greg, uh, yeah. and, and I want them to uh, either, you know, corroborate or, or ratify my theories or, or shoot them down and say, no, this is really what a woman with pleasure. That's what we'll do. <laughs> and this is, yeah, <laughs> and this is how, this is how they should go about it because I want, and I'm trying to do it across generations. So I might have your daughter, Devin, on as well. I haven't heard, you know, from yes. her. Yes, yet, she is. Uh, she'll represent so, the 30s. Uh, she's right there in the middle of it, right? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, yes. looking looking for that man. So Absolutely. So we have so much to talk about. So do you mind if we if we continue this conversation on and make this a two-part segment? Because there's so of many course. things that we want to talk about. We've barely been touched stuff. upon so many things. Um that I was hoping to do in the 27 minutes. Well, this has been great stuff. And so we'll get back to it next week, right, babe? That's right. So we'll just continue the okay. conversation next week. And we okay. thank you so much. And those of you that are interested in his book, mm -hmm. you can go to Amazon.com and, and pick that book up for yourself. It's available in Kindle and also in print. And uh, make make sure you look under David L. Savage for The Savage Path. Or you can go to my website, okay. www.thesavagepath.com. I love it. The and Savage then you can uh, read some of the endorsements. So, you're, you know, it's just not a cold bot. You can see... Uh, a little bit more about the the podcast and stuff That's as well. right. And learn more about you. Okay, great. All right. Well, thank you. And as always, remember there are two kinds of fire in the world. The one that burns and consumes. And the one that burns and empowers. May God's word and God's love burn brightly in you, giving you strength to face any fire. Till next time, little embers. I'm Marie. <laughs> and I'm Greg. See, See you soon. soon. Through the Fire is a production of Family Vision Media, familyvisionmedia.org.